I got the Holy Ghost begging God to forgive me in front of everybody. Yes, it was loud. Yes, I looked stupid. Yes, I got snot all over everybody. But my life was transformed. Is that all right? Can that be our goal to see people's life changed? There's somebody that's coming to church somewhere next Sunday. They're on their way. They've already made up in their mind they're going to go to church next Sunday. You may not know it, but they already declared. They already said it in their heart or they verbalized it. This is my last time ever coming to church. They're giving it one more chance. I hope the main thing is the main thing. I hope we're not begging them for money. I hope they don't find a bunch of foolishness. I hope you're not carrying on carnal conversations. I hope they can come to an anointed sanctuary. Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. What's a covenant servant? We are servants of Yahweh. In order to keep the covenant as his servant, we must keep his commandments. If we break the commandments, we break the exclusive covenant that he made with us. Where can I find the specifics of this contract or covenant? Same word. Where can I find the specifics of this covenant in the word of God? That's where you find it. So a covenant servant is a servant that keeps the covenant found in scriptures. God will charge me and judge me based on scriptures. So it's imperative that I live my life according to scriptures. And according to scriptures only, what I think is irrelevant. What you say is irrelevant. What I say doesn't matter. Religion and denominations are pointless and unnecessary if or since it contrasts with the word of God. You are only, you're only required to live your life according to scripture. You are not required. You will not be judged by anything not written in scripture. How can God punish you for something he never told you not to do? He can, however, judge you for not doing what he told you to do in scripture. This is why we have to carefully, this is why we live carefully by the word of God only, not by my philosophy, not by my education, not by my feelings, and not by vain traditions. With the scriptures, we can find out if a home church is scriptural. We can find out if you must go to church to be saved. With the word of God, we can find out if there's anything you do in your church every week. We can find out if it's scriptural or not. I want y'all to meet Arden and Alea. They just got married. They want to get their life to the Lord. Most people, most people go to the church that they grew up in. Most people are in the same denomination that their parents introduced them to. With so many conflicting denominations, Arden, Aaliyah, this couple, they, they can't settle on what church to go to. They can't settle on what religion to follow or what to do to be saved. Because we made it so difficult. We, mankind, we, church folk, we, God's chosen people, we made it almost impossible to figure out the plan of salvation. Grab 10 preachers. You'll get 10 answers. I want to help this couple. Let's see if we can help this couple today. But we're going to help them using scripture. So Arden and Alea, they didn't grow up in church. They don't have a denomination that was passed down from their parents. But they want to be right. Anybody else want to be right? Anybody just want to please God? Anybody just want to know to do the right thing? What creates, or should I say, who creates the culture in your church? Your denomination at your church has a different culture than a church with the same denomination 10 miles down the road. You ever see two churches next door to each other? Two different denominations? Members don't even speak to each other? Which of those churches should Arden lead his family to? How would he know which door to walk through? If he asks me, I'll start with, okay, this is what you do, Arden. Whichever church has a culture of entering with thanksgiving and praise, I'm not going to a dead church. No. I'm not going to a church where exuberant praise is taboo. I'm not going to a church where the pastor isn't giving high praise and leading his people into worship. 
I won't go there. In most of our churches, brother pastor, he don't even show up until after praise and worship. Or he interrupts praise and worship for his grand entrance. Hey, Arden, find a place of worship where people aren't gossiping outside. Find a place of worship where people are entering in the gates, where they're coming through the door saying, thank you, Jesus. Find a place where you feel convicted if you don't praise God out of your flesh. Your carnal conversations won't attract me. I went to a church once and the usher was stuffing tithes envelopes all up in my face before I even say praise the Lord. Before I even walked in the door, get out the way. You don't know what people gone, you don't know what people have gone through before they get to church in the morning. That's why the church, the church ought to create an atmosphere for God's people to worship him. That's the purpose of the church. When I get to church, I want to hear somebody say, praise the Lord. I want to hear you say, praise the Lord when I walk through the door. When I enter in the sanctuary, I want to hear the sweet sound of worship. When, 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 when prayer is going on at the church, I want everybody to be praying and lifting up God. I want to hear the thunder of prayer. I went to church once, one uh, Tuesday night, and the person in front of me was playing with their baby. The person behind me was talking about a recipe. The person on the side laughing about something. We got uh, two people uh, walking around, in and out, excuse me, getting in and out. There, there, out of 50 people in the church, there was two people at, at the so-called altar. People moving in and out, coming in and out of the door, doing all type of stuff, having all kind of conversations. I said, I just, it doesn't make sense for me to be here. I got interrupted so many times. And th this is, this is, this is prayer. This is, this is talking to God. I got interrupted so many times and there was so much non-prayer going on. I got up and left. I can pray at home. Tonight, we're gonna, we're gonna go through the entire church. And we're gonna see if pastors set up their own kingdom or if the church is actually scriptural. Why? So you can know what to look for or what to run from. Why not be in a church run by the word? Why not be in a church where God is pleased? Why not be where the anointing dwells? That's why I wanna be. Where is that place that the spirit of the Lord is? Where is that place where I can have freedom to honor my God and give him glory and get help and instruction on how to live my life according to scriptures? I want to be in a scriptural church or I create one myself. There was a time, believe it or not, where scriptures were important. I want to get you back or I want to get you into the habit of requiring BCV. Book, chapter, verse. BCV. Don't accept anything not written in these 80 books. Let the word of God be your foundation. Let the word of God be a lamp to your feet. Let the word of God direct your path. Force your flesh to be governed by the words of the almighty God. What about praise dancers? Let's start with them. Praise dancers wearing undergarments and kicking their legs up in church. That's in the Bible, right? Can you show me where I can find a requirement to go to church on Sunday. Book chapter verse. BCV. Please. I need the book or the chapter or the verse that shows your denomination. The reason people can't live their lives according to scripture is because some of the stuff at your church ain't biblical. Some of the stuff at your church is not found anywhere in scripture. Don't get mad at me. A lot of this stuff, they want to hold on. Hold on to it pleases them. But obeying scripture pleases God. This is the post-pandemic church time now. And the post-pandemic church membership is drastically lower. Part of the reason is because people are trying to survive. Churches in urban communities, churches in our communities, have charged and taxed God's people to the point that if, if people, if they can finally afford to live if they don't go to church. Churches in our communities have created a culture where people try to be smart. And, and they used to leave the checkbook at home. And that was a smart thing to do because if they leave their checkbook at home, they don't get guilted into donating what they can't afford. People only allow a certain amount of money in their purse on Sundays. Because if you bring too much money, you, you won't be able to avoid having to pay for the building fund. Again, church ain't finished building yet. You, you got, we got pastor anniversary offering. We got debt retirement offering. We got offering lines. Wrap around the church. We got tithes. I need a scripture that tells me what I should donate.
Because all I find is alms and offering. Other than that, listen, take your money and take care of your family. There is a requirement for your church to take care of the needy and the widows. I need to see exactly how your church follows this scripture here. James 1, 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless. That's what pure religion is. And widows in their affliction. The amount of homeless people, the amount of hungry people in your zip code should be diminished. With your prosperity message, right, Pastor? Dear Pastor, would you kindly sell your Mercedes and pawn your fat ring so that Sister Mongo or Sister Watermelon can pay for their medication? She's been struggling since her husband died and you've been telling her, oh, God gonna bless you. Why don't you follow scripture and bless her? The Bible says, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. The homeless person on the corner that the Bible requires you to give alms to, why don't you sell one of those big screens and buy that guy a meal? Show me when the church that you want me to join visited the orphanage as the scripture requires. That table, you know that table that you keep the offering plates on or the offering baskets under, and you call it an altar? Why? You still making animal sacrifices? No. So why do you need an altar? One church, they got rid of it. And they just called the front of the church the altar. We're just going to call this the altar. We're just going to say it's the altar. That's what we're going to do. Okay. And then they designate people to stand there and pray for people. And they call those people altar workers. BCV, please. Book, chapter, verse. When we were required to have an altar for animal sacrifices, there were rules, there were dimensions that the altar had to be built, there were, there were rules that had to be met. You could take that table that you call an altar, roll it in the alley for the garbage man to pick it up. Then you'll have more room. You'll have more room for the praise dancers to kick up their legs and show their private parts. These people standing at the altar, praying and laying hands on people, I would like to know, what was their purification process last night? How did you purify yourself the night before? You, you want to cast cancer out of me, but your breath smell like cigarettes. You, you suck it on cancer sticks, but you want, to cancer, you want to call cancer out of somebody. How did you consecrate yourself this week before you go laying hands, especially last night? How did you consecrate yourself? What exactly did you do before you go laying hands on God's precious people's face? What did you do? What's the purification process that you have? Most churches, they try to have a communion service every year on non-biblical Good Friday. Believe it or not, there, there's still some preachers that teach there's a such thing as Good Friday. Book chapter verse. Show me how Yeshua, Jesus, can be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights from Friday and get up on Sunday. Why, why do we blindly follow this stuff? What's, re, what's, what's wrong with requiring a scripture? Why are you offended? Why are you offended that I'm trying to live my life according to the scriptures? When? Show me when. Show me when did they have communion, a communion service. Show me when they had a communion service in the Bible. They never had a communion service. That's not scriptural. They celebrated Passover. Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples. They fellowshiped on a feast day and communed with each other. You know what churches have done? Okay, churches have eliminated the feast day. They say we don't need to do the feast day anymore. Churches ignore Passover. They just eat crackers and drink wine. Is bread a cracker? Is a bread and a cracker the same thing? And how long have crackers been on their table? People like me are just trying to just live their life according to the Bible. Okay? We're just trying to live holy. We're just trying to walk up right before God. We're not doing anything that we're not supposed to be doing. We're just trying to follow the Bible. So, okay. Arden is pleased because you did like Hezekiah said. You cleaned up the sanctuary. You got rid of all the non-scriptural stuff, right? You got it all out. In 2 Chronicles 29, 5, and King Hezekiah said unto them, Listen, priests, sanctify now yourselves. Clean yourself up. Purify yourself. Separate yourself. Pray. Fast. Don't just show up to church. Consecrate yourself first. 
He said, and sanctify, get all this foolishness out of the house of the Lord, out of the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and get that filthiness out of the holy place. Okay, so you've done that. Okay, so Arden is happy. He's pleased that now he can take his wife to a holy sanctuary, okay? So now, now he's, he's, he's come to a holy sanctuary, and now you say he has to join your church. How? BCV. I got my Bible. It's open. Where can I find the rules for joining a church? BCV, book, chapter, verse for the rules or the requirements to join your church. Shake the preacher hand. And, you know, some churches, some churches require you to shake everybody in the church hand before you can get on the church roll. What is that? I had a church tell me once, oh, okay, you just need to come a couple more times and then, then we can put you on a roster. Am I wrong? If I don't care about your roster, whatever that is, anybody know the roster? Who cares? I have to come a certain amount of times before I can get on your roster. I, I'm, 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 I don't understand what, what we're doing here because it's not scriptural. Where, where do we get this stuff from? And why isn't it uniform across God's churches? You know why it's not uniform? Or you know how to get it uniform? You follow the scriptures. If it's written, do it exactly how it's written. If it's not written, get that filth out of the sanctuary. Now, of course, there's some things that you have to naturally do if you're going to run any gathering, any successful gathering. There's things that you're going to have to do that you're not going to find in scripture. I'm not talking about that. But there have been people that got kicked out of church because if you join something, you can lose membership, right? And people have lost membership. They got kicked out of church for, for something as simple as not asking pastor for permission to do something or, or another infraction that's not even a sin or it's not even written in scripture. And people have allowed that to be a source of major change in their lives. And they have allowed that to be a major problem because they have lost, they, 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 they got kicked out of a, a church. We're doing things that the Bible doesn't require. We are required to do all things decently and in order, in order. In the same order. Paul wants to know in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How come, Paul is asking, how come when you come to church, you got a song and you got another song? How come each person got their own doctrine, their own denomination? How come you got one tongue and you got a different one? You got one revelation, you got an opposing revelation. How is it that you have one interpretation and you over there got a total different interpretation. Paul said that all things be done unto edifying. That's why Psalm says, oh, magnify the Lord with me, with me. Let us exalt his name separately. Let us exalt his name and 12 and undergo color. Let us exalt his name together in order, in one order. I know, I know I'm going to get a lot of comments talking about how beneficial uh, children churches and I agree with you it could be a benefit but what you can't do is show me scripture to justify the invention of this new children church that just came about I praise the Lord in the sanctuary when I was a child just like everybody else when I was a child when I was growing up as a child I saw miracles with my own eyes that's why as I got older I couldn't get so far away from it because I know what the truth is because I've seen it Yeshua said, suffer the children to go cut and paste and not come to me, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing, separating, or we're supposed to do things in order. They got prayer rooms now. Y'all make too much noise. You, you, you're interrupting the service. Go, go over there so you don't interrupt the pastor's wonderful message. Leave the holy sanctuary, leave the consecrated sanctuary, and go over there and pray for the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost begging God to forgive me in front of everybody. Yes, it was loud. Yes, I looked stupid. Yes, I got snot all over everybody. But my life was transformed. Is that all right? Can that be our goal to see people's life changed? There's somebody that's coming to church somewhere next Sunday. They're on their way. They've already made up in their mind they're going to go to church next Sunday. You may not know it. But they already declared, they already said it in their heart, or they verbalized it. This is my last time ever coming to church. They're giving it one more chance. I hope the main thing is the main thing. 
I hope we're not begging them for money. I hope they don't find a bunch of foolishness. I hope you're not carrying on carnal conversations. I hope they can come to an anointed sanctuary and find the spirit of the Lord there. I hope you're not sending them away to go pray. What if they don't know how to pray? Hmm? What if it's a person, this is their first time coming to church? What if they don't know how to pray? I, I hope when this person comes to church, I hope the offering can wait. I hope the announcements can wait. I hope the songs you sing are holy. I hope the words you use are kind. I hope they hear you enter the sanctuary praising God. Whenever y'all come in here, I want y'all to say praise the Lord. I want to keep this sanctuary holy. I hope they can come and get baptized properly. Because there's only one way to get your sins remitted. I hope there's somebody at your church with a revelation and they can teach this couple that you must be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. I hope you know the Bible enough to tell them that nobody ever got baptized in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost anywhere in the Bible. Never happened. I hope you know where in the scripture you can find the thousands of people that got baptized in Jesus' name. I hope when this person comes to church that you know where Paul rebaptized people that were baptized wrong. Somebody got to tell them the truth. What happens if you're baptized improperly and the Lord comes? See, that's the difference in two churches right next door to each other. One may have the revelation. But what if the other one doesn't? How do you know? That's the point of this message today. Book, chapter, verse. The scriptures will not have me wasting my time considering a church that baptizes incorrectly. The scriptures are there to guide me to find a church where I can get right, where I can be right, where I can uh, follow hard after God. All right, let's deal with the choir. Choirs were invented during the medieval era. Did you know that? Me personally, I love, I love an anointed holy choir. Where in scriptures can I find choir? If you don't have a choir, you can't have church. Is it okay if we sing them same songs Paul and Silas sang in jail? Can we gather together wherever we are and just lift up Jesus? There's nothing wrong with a group of saints singing holy songs. No, it's not. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, the Bible says the Levites, the priests, after they sanctified themselves. Did you see that? They didn't just show up to church. After they sanctified themselves, because see, the Levites were the singers of the church. You see that? The priests were the singers. The priests were the praise team. You see that? The preachers were the praise team. They had 120 priests doing what today's preachers think is beneath them. I show up afterwards or interrupt it. It's beneath me. I'm not singing no song. Can you imagine the sound of 120 sanctified men of God? singing and blowing trumpets. Can you imagine what that would sound like? I'm talking holy men of God all at the same time. The scripture said in verse 13, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Then, then the house was filled with a cloud. The entire house of the Lord filled with a holy cloud. Imagine the people that showed up late and missed it. Imagine that, rumbun that rumbunctious boy that you can't get him to act right. Uh, imagine him missing an opportunity to be in the real presence of the Lord because he downstairs coloring. And miss out on the Shekinah glory of God. Verse 14. They sang... And they praised God and they blew a trumpet until the cloud came so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Show me a church like that. I'll go today. Imagine if this was the goal of every church to usher in the Shekinah glory of God. Imagine if we worship until God literally showed up. Imagine a church where the preachers were there for one purpose and one goal, to usher in the presence of the Lord. Imagine if his message wasn't all that important. Imagine if, if the, the main thing, the, the paramount thing, 
was giving God total praise. Imagine if the pastor had the church set up just like that for that one purpose. Instead, we got some churches that allowed a pastor to interrupt praise and worship for his grand entrance. I was in a church once and I took note during testimony service of how many times the pastor's name was mentioned compared to how many times Jesus' name was mentioned. And the, the, the pastor sat there with his big feet. He sat in a pulpit with his legs wide open and he accepted all the praise and all his accolades. He never told the saints, stop. Stop talking about me. Give God the glory. But it's okay. Because Matthew 23 verse 11 says, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You ever see a pastor with hands so precious he can't carry his own Bible? He need a, he need a grown man to carry his Bible. Imagine if pastors stayed in their role, their biblical role. What's the pastor's biblical role? Preach, teach, usher in the glory of God. Usher in the glory of God until you can't even preach. All right, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Show me where in the Bible where it says I can't go straight to God. Show me book, chapter, and verse where the veil in the temple remains. Show me where... I'm supposed to confess to my pastor and not to my mediator, which is Christ Jesus. Your pastor is not your mediator. And if he is, what's the point of Jesus? Tell Jesus you're sorry. Tell Jesus you want to be right. Tell Jesus you'll never sin again. Tell Jesus you appreciate him for making an intercession for you. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, we all, all of us, every last one of us, we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. God is going to be the one on that seat. Jesus, God, is going to be on that seat. That everyone is going to get the, going to get the judgment for the things done in your body. You have to pay for everything you've done in your body. According that he has done, whether it be good or bad, everybody must stand before God. I thought they said Christ. The only way that makes sense is that Jesus is Christ. Everybody must stand before God and give an account for every deed done in your body. You're not getting away with anything. That includes your pastor. He has to give an account for his own life. Yes. Plus what he preached and taught you. Plus how he conducted the church. If it was in a manner according to scriptures. Why are we not focused with healing the sick? And taking care of the widows. And helping the needy and the orphan. Why aren't we concerned about ushering the cloud, the glory of God, as much as we're dedicated to things that you can't find anywhere in Scripture? I'm not burning your candle. I'm not bowing to no statue. No, you can't put no cracker in my mouth. Here's your first assignment. In the boxes below, I want you to put BCV, book, chapter, verse. I want you to put the book, the chapter, and the verse for each of the things that we do at church. So I need BCV for pouring water on a baby head. I need BCV for anointing that car. BCV for pouring water on the baby head. BCV for anointing your car. I need BCV for putting olive oil on people's forehead. Show me that. When a preacher puts olive oil on your forehead, how long you have to leave it there before you wipe it off? Where? Show me exactly where. Give me the book, the chapter, and the verse in the Bible where it tells you to use olive oil to anoint people. In the boxes below, Show me BCV for joining a church. Don't get mad at me. Just drop the scripture. Just put the scripture in the box for those things. I hope we're all clear by now on what the church is supposed to be and what the on what will make the sanctuary holy. I hope I made my point. Can't go over everything. If I say some other things, I just make people mad. I hope I made my point though about what we're supposed to be doing, what we're supposed to have in the church. We're supposed to be getting that cloud in the church. That's what we're supposed to be doing. What is the church supposed to be? According to Jesus himself, the church is supposed to be a house of prayer. Not a place for hooking up, buying and selling, networking and, and, and gossiping. It should, be, it should be for fellowship, iron sharpening iron, bearing the burden of each other, exhorting others, and for bringing God a worshiper. Because if you want God to give you something, you have to give God something. All right, y'all remember Arden and Ayla? Alea? Alea? They want to give their life to the Lord, okay? 
They want to follow scriptures only. They want the book, the chapter, and the verse. They want to know what to do if they aren't able to find a book, chapter, verse church. What am I supposed to tell them? Which denomination should I send them to? Your denomination, right? Which church should I send them to? Which church should I send them to? Because I'm a covenant servant, I'm going to give them book, chapter, and verse. That's how we roll here. I'm going to say, Arden, get your wife, go in the living room, and praise God. I'm going to tell them, hey, Arden, start thanking God for every blessing. I'm going to show them in the Bible where it says, where there's two or three gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. Hey, Arden, God will show up in your house. Start praising him. Watch what happens. T tell him, thank you for waking me up this morning. Tell him, tell him, thank you for the ability to feel the sun rays on my body. And, and thank you for, for how my lungs expand and contract. Thank you that I got eyes to see. Thank you that I got legs to walk. Thank you that there's no pain in my body. Arden, start praising God and watch what happens. Tell him thank you. Watch what happens. Give God glory in your own house. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read Arden the scripture that says, Know that the Lord our God don't dwell in temples that are made with man's hands. Hey Arden, God wants to tabernacle with you. He wants to dwell in you. He wants to commune with you. He wants to spend time with you. He created a day of rest reserved just for you to hang out with him. That's the same day, it's the same exact day that some folk forget all about. That's the day some folk ignore. God created a whole day and said, hey, Adam, don't do no work. Hang out with me today. Imagine waking up. Imagine it. You waking up and God is standing right by your bed. Imagine it. That's literally what's happening. When you wake up in the morning, God is standing there waiting on his praise, waiting on you to talk to him. Is this why things didn't work out for you? Did you go to church looking for God? Why didn't you bring him with you? The scripture says, don't you know you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Do you know how special you are? If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you are the equivalent of the olden days Ark of the Covenant. The Lord is forever present with you. He's constantly with you. He, he hears you. He, he hears what you hear. He sees what you see. He knows your pain and he knows who's trying to sabotage you. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, Answer this question for me. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, how do you leave one place or any place and go to another place looking for him? If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, how do you leave one place with God? Tell me how this makes any sense. And go to another place looking for God. How did you leave your home with God and go searching for God? Your, your, your body is the temple. Your body is the temple of God. Your body is the temple of God. Oh, Sorry. Acts 7 and 38. The Bible says this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Uh, who is he? Jesus. What physical building was in the wilderness? What is the address of whatever building called church in the wilderness? What was the physical church in the wilderness? At the first mention that you find church, and by the way, the word church doesn't appear in the Old Testament. The first time at the first mention of church, there was no physical building for church. You know why? Because you are the church, not the building. You are the church. You are able to display God wherever you go. You can. You are required to represent holiness. Wherever you go, that's why you can't have road rage because you're representing God and you're supposed to be displaying God. This is what God looks like on earth. This is this is why you, you, you can't give people a piece of your mind. This is why you have to dress modestly. You can't go everywhere you, because, because you are the church. You can't do everything because you are the church. Grandma, you cannot worship God at home. You can't pray at home. You can't fellowship with the saints at home. God ain't gonna talk to you at home. You gotta go to church. Grandma in a wheelchair. Grandma got an oxygen tank. Grandma don't have a way to get there. Not too long ago, I tried to comfort a brother that was going through a very horrible time in his life. 
And I told him, listen, doc, that God is trying to get your attention and it's time for you to give your life to him. The first thing out of his mouth was, there ain't no church near me. And that's true. The, the place where he lives, they don't have a physical church building that he can make it to. He has some ailments. It's not possible. And this brother is sad because he's at his wit's end. He can't take it anymore. What if he believed he could just begin to talk to God? What if he what if, what if, what if within his heart he knew that he can just say, Jesus, help me? What if grandma don't care about what you think and knew that she could have some church in her bed, in the hospital room? What if, what if grandma knew she could have church while she's walking down the stairs? Praising God is always in order. Yeah, we need to stop limiting God to four walls. We need to, we, we need to, what, why, does the, why does the Bible say in Acts 20, 20? It says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But he showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Why is Apostle Paul teaching from house to house? Is this Philemon 1, 2? Mm -hmm. It says, unto our beloved Aphia and Acryphus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Who are these people that started a church in the house? Yeah. Romans 16 and 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Are these people out of order? Is there a BCV for church in your house? I just read it. There is a BCV for church in your house. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Why did Aquila and Priscilla start a church in their house? Why are churches saluting a house ministry? What's wrong with you getting your family, not waiting until Sunday, and having church in your house? What's wrong with that? Acts 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every, every house, they didn't stop pre-teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Hey, Arden, write the scripture down. Go show it to your wife. Why? Tell me why is it weird? Why is it taboo to start singing praises to God in your own home? Would that be hard for you? Don't you, don't you know you can get God to come in the midst of two or three of you gathered in his name? Why would Arden and his wife be out of order to worship God in his own home? What, what would it take for you, man of God, to grab your family and begin to praise God in your own house? We at Colossians 4, 15, salute the brethren, which are in Laodicea, Laodicea, Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in thy house. You know when the Holy Ghost came in Acts chapter 2? What's the name of the church they were in? What denomination were they? The Acts 2 verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. We've all heard this scripture. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. I hope it doesn't upset you to know that the Holy Ghost showed up where people were gathered in his name in one accord together in order in a house. They didn't have some folk in a prayer room and kids downstairs and the cooks in the kitchen. They were all upstairs in somebody's house, worshiping God all night long and keeping a feast day. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with worshiping God in your own house? Matthew 21, 13. Would you like to live in this place right here? This, I don't know where this is. Maybe it's Fiji. I don't know. Would you like to live here? And this is the same exact spot. Would you like to live here? This beautiful island. It's perfect temperature all year round. What would that be? 75 degrees all year round, every day. You can't. You know why? Because you can't go to church here. There's no church here. If you live in a place where there's no church or church is illegal, like some countries where church is illegal, did you know that? Are you telling me that God can't get any glory out of your life just because they don't have a physical building? There are people that live in countries today where churches are illegal. They can't be saved. If the government shut churches down in this country again, your church, you're telling me the whole world is hopeless? If you find yourself living in a city where church is an option, or if you are immobile, 
anymore and you can't get to physical church. If you're in hospice, come on, y'all. If, if you're in prison, really? There's, if you're in prison, there's still a pathway to get to God. Yes, you can still worship him. Yes, you can still keep his commandments. You don't have to walk away from God just because you've been hurt by a church. You don't have to walk away from God just because you've been church hurt and you think you can't find another one that you can be saved in. You can worship God at home. How does he find a church? Just pick one for the neighborhood? Go online and watch the, the, the church service? Do that first, go, uh, Google it? Go wherever your coworkers go? I would tell him, please, don't let another week go by without worshiping God, even and including in your own home. I would tell him, find a church that's lined up with scripture. But until then, Get your family and praise God. We, we need to pray for people like Arden and his family. We, we, we need to pray that God shows his people his holy word. That the word of God reaches them somewhere. And that's how you can help. You can be instrumental in helping the next soul get saved. You can be a part of that. You can be a part of this ministry that's trying to reach the loss at any cost. Because we certainly need your help. That's why we're asking you to connect with us. Of course, I would tell Arden. Wherever he lives, you and your wife can become covenant servants. And that includes you. We'd love to have you. You can worship and fellowship with us every Friday night at 7 p.m. and Tuesday night at 7 p.m. right from your own home. If you don't have a church home or if you don't have a home church, contact us. We would love to have you. We would love to be your spiritual covering. But by any means necessary, worship God in your own home. Don't wait once a week to go to a place that you're hoping is there and everything is gonna work out fine. Worship God wherever you can. Worshiping God in your home is in order. Praising God in your own home makes sense. You'll be closer to God. Read your own Bible. Gather your family man of God and worship God. And when you go to church, do the things that the Bible require. Book, chapter, verse. Live your life according to book, chapter, verse. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. See you next Friday at 7 p.m.